Welcome everyone to our February Liberal Values Lab with my co-author. I'm so happy to have you here, Winkfield Twyman Jr. We co-wrote Letters in Black and White. It's good and, to be here this morning. Yes, thank you. So one of the things that we do in our book is talk about pioneering Black pioneers <laughs> and the legacy of Black pioneers. And we were so lucky recently to meet up with some descendants of Reverend Lemuel Haynes. And it was such an enriching conversation that Wink went on to do even more work and more research on Lemuel Haynes. And in Wink's mind, and Wink, will, I'll let you describe this a little bit more, um, his legacy in some ways is a new definition of Black history and how to see and review Black history. And so with that in mind, Wink, I will Thank you so much for being here. The format will go. We will, Wink will talk and give a little presentation that we are recording. So if you've missed anything, I'll have that up on YouTube shortly. And after his presentation, we will just have an open conversation about what Wink has had to share. So with that, Wink, I am going to share my screen and share your presentation and let you take it from here. Thank you, Jen. All of reality is never a single story. And uh, I wanted to start with that line. Uh, in, in many ways, Reverend Haynes was known for starting his sermons, particular biblical verse or passage. But good day to everyone here. Uh, and uh, thank you to not just Jen, but the Institute for Liberal Values for the opportunity to talk about someone who's just, uh, a phenomenal person from our past. Um, I also want to thank, before I begin, uh, Elizabeth Spivak, I hope I pronounced that correctly, um, for her assistance in this presentation, and of course, the wonderful people at the Journal of Free Black Thought, uh, in particular, Eric Smith and Jake McKay and Connie uh, Morgan. Uh, they've all been wonderful and supportive of my writing efforts uh, to look at uh, Black history in creative, original, and novel ways. And then finally, uh, I'm so delighted to have um, uh, uh, Bill Payne here, who is a descendant of Reverend, Reverend Limerell Haynes. And so uh, that's, a, that's a true delight indeed. Uh, and if there's anyone else here who's a descendant, uh, my, uh, uh, my joy and pleasure goes out uh, for your attendance here as well. So the question before us is, how do we define Black history? Does one story define Black history? Is Blackness oppression and nothing else matters? You know, it's interesting because um, when I think about Reverend Lemuel Haynes, uh, I think about someone who's very um, um, epic and, and memorable in terms of his impact on American history. Uh, I mean, he's a great man, so I'm quite humbled in, in, in talking about him this morning. You know, in the course of 30 minutes or an hour, there's no way I could ever uh, present uh, the full scope and range of the man. I mean, but the best I can do is to kind of um, distill key points about uh, Reverend Haynes and his character uh, and how that fits into our definition of Black history. Um, and his place in history. Uh, Chen, um, keep the screen there for a moment. I want to make a brief point here. When we try to define Black history, uh, it's important to understand, and this is always my, my starting premise, if there are over 40 million Black Americans, there are over 40 million life stories and experiences and perspectives. Um, Memories know no race. So for example, being Black doesn't tell you whether or not you grew up in a Southern suburb or Chicago. It doesn't tell you whether you grew up in the Delta of Mississippi or the Green Mountains of Vermont. And it doesn't tell you whether or not you were um, a congregate in the African Methodist Episcopal Church or if you were steeped in the Congregational Church in New England, of which Reverend Haynes was a pastor. 
my point being, every person brings their unique uh, upbringing and experience to our efforts to define Black history. And that's important because Black history ultimately is the aggregate of individual experiences. So if we're all individuals, um, I contend and I suggest that Black history is just a, a sum of the human lives of all of us of African descent in the U.S. But the tie that binds is one's sense of self. And it's also true that one can fall anywhere on the spectrum of life experiences and still be a Black American or not. It really comes down to one's sense of self. And I think that's a good working definition of Black history because it derives from what I call an internal locus of control as opposed to an external locus of control. In other words, what that means is that uh, one makes major decisions in life based upon uh, the things that one has control over as opposed to making major decisions in life based upon what the external world uh, imposes on you. And I would contend uh, that the major moral and spiritual crisis of our time isn't so much black and white or left versus right or conformity versus nonconformity. Um, I think the major conflict of our time would be the distinction between um, the, those who view life as external and based on external locus of control versus those who view life as internal locus of control and based upon one's internal uh, agency. So, which is why it is a delight to talk about Reverend Haynes today, because what he tells us, and we'll review his, his life story shortly, is that skin color does not define or make for a giant sized life. It's what one does for one's life that leaves a legacy to be remembered. I mean, and once again, I'm humbled because it's the year 2024 and I'm talking about a man in black history born in 1753 in West Hartford, Connecticut. Few people are remembered centuries later for their lives and their life deeds. And Reverend Haynes is such a man. He came into this world literally as a nobody in West Hartford, Connecticut. And when he left the world, everyone knew his name, be it in Granville, New York, Granville, Massachusetts, or Rutland, Vermont. And so I contend that's why Reverend Haynes matters because of his character and his life deeds and why we remember him today. Now, there are those who would view life differently and Black history differently. Um, I kind of lump these uh, people together, uh, broadly speaking, as the external locus of control gang. The touchstone being Blackness is oppression, nothing else matters. On the far left, we have uh, a gentleman by uh, the name of Ibram Kendi. He's a professor at uh, Boston University, and he's famously known for the doctrine of anti-racism. Simply put, racism defines Black history due to the absence, due to the presence of racial disparities. So anti-racism must be the raison d'etre for the existence of everything from sea to shining sea. And that is the filter, that is the single story in properly understanding Black history. Of course, I disagree, but that's one standpoint. Another standpoint, Point to the right would be uh, uh, Tana Hesse Coates, uh, a famous uh, writer and public intellectual who wrote a book, I believe in 2014, called Between the World and Me. Now, for uh, Mr. Coates, uh, the idea is that race has been part of the nation's DNA from the start. Life is race, race is racism, and that equals all things negative. So to properly understand Black history, one adopts a negative mindset. And moreover, it creates a compelling need for reparations for American slavery in the here and now, in the year 2024. I disagree with that mindset, but that's an example of what I call the 
external locus of control school of thought in defining Black history. And then in the center of our screen, we have the first Black president of Harvard University, uh, a former president today. Uh, Claudine Gay uh, would understand Black history as a story, a narrative, uh, where race has been used to oppress people of color, particularly Blacks, particularly Black women, particularly gay and queer Black women, trans women. Uh, the list goes on and on in terms of the intersexual uh, details. But the point being that because life and Black history is viewed from that standpoint uh, of permanent oppression, then uh, we really have to jettison other ways of thinking about life and Black history, such as merit and standards and enterprise and industry and achievement and character. All of those ideas are suspect, uh, I think, in uh, former President Gay's conception of Black history. Note that uh, the former president of Harvard uh, herself comes from a wealthy immigrant Haitian family, and she attended Phillips Exeter Academy, Stanford, and Harvard, with all of the advantages and privileges that uh, that accords one. Um, one will note that uh, Professor Gay had many, many advantages in life compared to uh, the subject of our lecture today, Reverend Haynes. I love this image. I love this image, and, and I can't really say why, except my intuition tells me it captures the admiration of a congregational pastor, Reverend Timothy Mather Cooley, for another congregational pastor, his contemporary, Reverend Lemuel, Lemuel Haynes. Um, and it goes to my point so directly. There are millions of ways to define Black history because each person who may be of African descent has a unique life story. What I'm going to do today is define Black history through the life story of Reverend Haynes. I mean, few Americans have been the subject of biographies. What compelled Timothy Mather Cooley, a Yaley, by the way, it, it, that may or may not matter, to write and complete an entire book about the life of Reverend Haynes three years after Reverend Haynes had passed away? What mattered so much? about Reverend Haynes. Notice the title of this book. I've considered the leading biography on Reverend Haynes. Sketches of the life and character of the Reverend Lemuel Haynes, for many years pastor of a church in Rutland and late in Granville, New York. The most important instinct in human psychology, it is said, is the maternal instinct. The bond between a mother and a baby is nearly uh, unbreakable. Uh, there are many examples in history where a mother has chosen death uh, to save her, her infant child. Um, this baby boy, the subject of our talk today, came into the world in 1753. And his mother was a white woman. Uh, and we know that the father was an African, uh, a full-blooded African. It is recorded that the mom looked at her baby and could not accept her baby and show the, 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 the proper and expected paternal instincts. Simply put, the baby boy was abandoned by his mother, the one person in the universe who should care about him more than anyone else on the planet. Researchers today know that the early years from zero to three are the most crucial years in terms of brain development. The more words that a baby hears between the ages of zero to three will have the greatest impact on that child's intellectual development. The degree of emotional attachment that baby experiences will have lifelong consequences 
if a baby shows emotional attachment disorder at 12 months, you can look at that baby's life 20 years down the road, and as a young person, a young adult, that person will still have emotional attachment disorder. So in this case, a baby boy born in 1753 was abandoned by his mother. What would happen to this baby boy? What would happen? Because for a new infant, the world's a scary place. It's a terrifying place. You're at the you're at the mercy of these these strange giants out there. Well, as fate would have it, uh, a family uh, from Granville, Massachusetts, Deacon David Rose and his wife took in this baby boy, uh, and he was named Lemuel Haynes, and they raised him from the age of five months old. And it said that the mother, Mrs. Rose, loved this baby boy, this abandoned baby, more than her own children. She gave him care, she gave him affection, she gave him attention. And Deacon David Rose uh, provided a superb home environment for this young uh, child. Uh, prayers were said daily, daily in the Deacon Rose home. Every Sabbath was observed religiously, no pun intended. And every Saturday evening before the Sabbath, the entire family would gather around and they would have re religious instruction. And so as a matter of good fortune, this abandoned baby who was on a path towards low brain development to be blunt about it, emotional disorder, was blessed to find himself in the most one of the most nurturing environments possible, the home of Deacon David and Mrs. Uh, David Rose. Um, it, is, it is recorded that at some point, at some point, the um, young man, the young kid, Reverend Haynes, ran into his mother, his biological mother, and she saw him, took one look, and fled. She ran away. And from that point on, uh, Lemuel developed a, a real aversion uh, to this woman who was his biological mother. So how did this kid learn, this young, this young kid who was now adopted by the uh, Deacon Rose family? Well, um, he was an indentured servant, which is one step above uh, being a slave. Um, he had sporadic schooling, but basically he learned to read every night uh, by the uh, the stone place fireplace in the Rose home, he self-taught himself to read the Bible, major literary works by the light of the burning logs in the fireplace. This, in a sense, was the prep school. This was the academy for uh, Reverend Haynes uh, as he became educated. When the war approached with Britain, uh, Haynes uh, recognized his patriotic duty, like many of his fellow citizens. Um, he joined the Minutemen, and the Minutemen were uh, a group uh, of men who engaged once a week in manual exercise, and they were renowned for being ready to roll and fight the British on a minute's notice. Um, in 1775, uh, uh, Lemuel Haynes would uh, actually join the army after the Battle of Lexington in 1775. One of the major battles for uh, Haynes was the Battle of Fort Ticonderoga uh, up in Vermont. Um, he was actually a volunteer on an expedition to expel the British enemy from the fort in 1776. As he would later recall in life, he saw scenes he would never forget. Uh, he served basically garrison duty at the recently captured fort uh, in 1776. Uh, Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain uh, boys were successful in those efforts. So after returning home, back to Granville, Massachusetts, in the home of uh, Deacon Rose, um, he began to uh, continue reading by the uh, fireplace light. On one Saturday evening before one Sabbath, he decided to show off his ability. So he didn't tell Deacon Rose um, what he was doing, but he actually 
read a sermon that he had prepared himself. Uh, he read it. It was it was ornate. It was eloquent. Uh, eloquent. Uh, it was um, it was moving. And when the sermon was read and concluded, Deacon Rose said to um, uh, Haynes, "Now, who who wrote that sermon? What fine minister or pastor, or scholar, or theologian wrote that sermon?" Haynes confessed that he had written the sermon. Deacon Rose was taken aback. Others present were taken aback. They were in the presence of, of a mind here, some type of, uh, some type of religious genius. Um, immediately, town folk urged Haynes to attend college uh, at Dartmouth. Uh, but Haynes wasn't ready for the opportunity. The doors were open for him at Dartmouth, but he just, he couldn't do it. He shrunk from the, uh, from the thought of it. But a great mind will not remain incurious. And so he, in lieu of Dartmouth College, began to study under Reverend Daniel Farron uh, of Canaan, Connecticut. And uh, he impressed uh, Reverend Farron. Uh, he was uh, impressive in his studies. He showed a, a, the, 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 the hint of genius in his ability to perceive and understand uh, religious doctrine. He had an original mind, a creative mind. Uh, as a result, um, he gained a license to preach the gospel and by 1785 was ordained as the first black minister in American history. He was developing a, a, a fabulous reputation as an inspiring preacher. Um, let me note before I continue that he lived essentially in an all-white world. Deacon Rose and, and Mrs. Rose, who raised him, were white um, congregationalist, pious. Um, uh, the Reverend Theron was was white. Um, Dartmouth was a predominantly white school at the time. Um, and so it's interesting to me that it does not seem that race or race consciousness kept Haynes from pursuing his intellectual curiosity and his intellectual destiny in a sense. Um, was he concerned about slavery? Well, you bet. Uh, in 1776, he penned an essay called Liberty Further Extended in which he made the aggressive case for liberty and that that should extend to viewing slaveholding as illegal. Surprise, <laughs> not just because he was himself a black American, but because he also knew the peculiar disadvantages of living as an indentured servant. So his, his affinities are not surprising in that regard. Um, on March 28th, 1788, Black history was made uh, once again when a small church in West Rutland, Vermont, called Reverend Haynes uh, to minister uh, in her pulpit. It was a white church, and Reverend Haynes uh, was a, a black minister. Um, he would teach at this church in West Rutland, Vermont, for 30 years. He developed a reputation for stirring sermons. Um, in fact, due to his growing authority uh, in theology, uh, Middleburg College awarded Reverend Haynes an honorary master's degree in 1804. Once again, he broke another racial barrier in a sense. He became the first Black American to receive an honorary college degree. Um, I'm going to quickly note this. Um, I am not an expert on universal salvation as theological concept, but there was a raging dispute between another Reverend, Hosea Balu, and Reverend Haynes on universal salvation. Uh, Reverend Balu was a proponent of it, Reverend Haynes was an opponent. I mentioned that disagreement because this was an example of what a, a mind Reverend Haynes was. On one Sabbath, Haynes was supposed to be out of the parish at another church. Reverend Balu was scheduled to come to Haynes's home church and to preach a sermon in favor of universal salvation, which everyone knew Reverend Haynes opposed. Some friends of Reverend Haynes prevailed upon him to return to church 
and to hear what Reverend Ballou had to say in his own pulpit. Reverend Ballou gave a stirring defense of universal salvation. Don't ask me about the details of that doctrine. And it is said by those who were there that Reverend Haynes, who didn't plan to be there, he just was convinced at the last moment to attend. He was asked by Reverend Ballou, well, now, what do you have to say? Do you have any opposition to my words? On the fly, Reverend Haynes took to the pulpit and developed one of the most stirring defenses of his position in opposition to universal salvation as a doctrine uh, at that time. It, it was pure logic, pure grace, pure extemporaneous, extemporaneous speaking. People remarked that when it came to extemporaneous speaking, Reverend Haynes was almost transcendent in his authority and his power. His on-the-fly remarks were reprinted throughout Northern New England, and uh, people knew that they were in the presence of something great uh, from that point on. This is a picture uh, of Reverend Haynes uh, in the pulpit at his congregation, and I thank uh, Bill Payne uh, for this uh, depiction. Um, what is Black history? What is it? You know, in its purest form, Black history is simply human history. Black history is a thousand and one dimensions of what we call character and virtue, perspectives, experiences. And that's why the idea that there's one story about history, Black history, that Black history is oppression, nothing else matters, is such a falsehood. It's so wrong. I mean, good Kendi, former President Gay and Coates, understand a Black minister before his congregation, all white, in the early 1800s in Rutland, Vermont, reigning supreme as an intellectual force, as an intellectual power. I just wonder. I, I think sometimes some people dismiss and ignore parts of the human story that don't align with uh, precast narratives. And before I continue, I want to take a moment uh, to read something, because uh, sometimes the best words come from the man himself. Uh, I, I admire Reverend Haynes greatly, but I would never profess to be 10% of the man that this guy was. I want to read to you the farewell sermon, the last sermon he gave his congregants uh, when he left the church. Uh, I think he had served for 30 years in Rutland, Vermont. And I quote, it was 30 years ago, the 28th day of March last, since I took the pastoral care of this church and people. The church then consisted of 42 members, since which time there have been about 312 added to it. About 60 have been removed by death, and about 400 have died in this society, including those above mentioned. There were, there were only 10 of the church now living in this place who were here when I first came to you, the greater part sleep and death. I have preached about 5,500 sermons, 400 of them funeral sermons. I have witnessed more than 100 marriages. Twice I have been brought to the borders of the grave, but God has spared me to see this day of trial in which I resigned from my pastorship. Those are stirring words. <clears throat> Those are words of someone who, um, in a sense, is speaking to universal parts of the human condition in a small Rutland church. And we can all resonate with that because the deepest elements of Black history are human history. And human history at its bottom are about those universal traits. Um, I don't want to uh, uh, leave on such a, um, um, a dramatic note because 
in real life outside of the pulpit, Reverend Haynes certainly had his lighter moments. Uh, I'll share two quick stories. One, Reverend Haynes was officiating uh, a marriage. And after the marriage was over, the couple came to him and said, well, what is your usual fee for a marriage? And Reverend Haynes said to the couple, newly married couple, well, you know, if people show promise and respectability, you know, I, I expect a fair, generous sum. But if people are full of poor things, I don't expect so much. They immediately gave him a big fee for performing their ceremony. It's called reverse psychology. I love it. I love it. Um, what's the second story? Uh, the second story is um, Reverend Haynes. Oh, yes. Reverend Haynes was out working in the field one day in Rutland, Vermont. Had on his field clothes. He was a regular kind of guy. He knew how to work in the fields. Um, he was not dainty. He was not a Yale or a Harvard graduate. Uh, just a, a simple man. So a guy came over from a neighboring town and he said, hey, um, I, I, I have a funeral coming up and I need to speak with uh, Reverend Haynes. Can you tell me where I can find him? Reverend Haynes said, my name is Haynes. The guy said, no, 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 no. I mean, Mr. Haynes, the preacher. And Reverend Haynes replied, well, you know, I try to preach sometimes. And that to me, that's delightful. This is a man who had preached over 5,000 sermons, yet was not so full of himself in real life outside of the pulpit. Just delightful, just a delightful character. Many people, I think, have tried to capture all of Reverend Haynes, and none of us will ever be successful because he was such an amazing part of our American past. Uh, this landmark reads, you know, Lever Limerell Haynes, born in West Hartford, Connecticut in 1753, was the son of mixed race parents indentured at the age of five months to a devout churchman. Haynes was an ardent student of the Bible. In 1785, he became the first ordained African-American minister in the U.S., traveling throughout Vermont as an itinerant preacher. In 1787, he was called to minister to the congregational community of the West Parish of Brooklyn. The meeting house where he preached for 30 years was located near the cemetery. An outstanding preacher and writer, Haynes was well regarded as both churchman and author, recognized as the first black minister to serve in white parishes of New England. Haynes died in 18. 33. And I think that is a pretty good attempt to capture the character of Reverend Haynes. Um, Reverend Cooley uh, suggested that when you met this man, you were taken by certain aspects of him. I'm going to ask everyone, look at this man carefully. Look at his eyes. Look at his skin tone. Look at his face. Look at his smile. It is said that the very first part of his character you recognized when you met the Reverend was a particular, a peculiar expression in his face that communicated great perception, great vision. You felt his presence. It was also said that he, he was a tender person. He sympathized with those in distress. He had a quickness of perception, had a great memory. Quote, Bible and verse on the spot uh, in extemporaneous sermons. He had a mature judgment. He was a man of enterprise. When he was a young man, it was said that he always went to know more when he went to sleep at night than when he arose first thing in the morning. That's, that's man born of enterprise. Um, in fact, uh, Reverend uh, Simeon Harmony of Westport, Westport, New York, in remembering Reverend Haynes, went so far as to say, and I quote, he was something more than human. That's a contemporary who knew Reverend Haynes. 
I, re I return your attention to the biography and the front cover of the biography. It's not titled Sketches of the Life and Oppression of the Le Reverend Limerell Haynes, but it's the character of Reverend Lemuel Haynes. And to conclude my lecture, because I want to have time for questions, Black historian Daniel Murray, I think around the 1890s, did some digging, did some research. And what did he find out? He found out that there were members of a family that had consciously gone around New England and destroyed every copy of an autobiography of Reverend Haynes that they could find. Why would they do that? Why would a family do that? Well, here's the rest of the story as I conclude my lecture. The family in question was the prominent Goodwin family of Hartford, Connecticut. And the Goodwins are well known as one of the founding families of Hartford. What uh, historian Daniel Murray surmised was that one day, 1753, 1752, hard to say, there was uh, an encounter at a hotel in Hartford, Connecticut. There was a daughter of the prominent Goodwin family, and she met an African waiter at a hotel. And from that uh, interaction uh, was conceived Reverend Haynes. Years later, years later, when Reverend Haynes had become a household name known throughout Vermont, Connecticut, Massachusetts, years later, his biological mother reached out. She made overtures to her biological son. And I'm paraphrasing. You know, sure, I abandoned you as an infant baby and fled away at the sight of you. Hey, but now you are famous and I want to claim you. It is said by uh, the historian Murray, Reverend Haynes did not respond to his biological mother's overtures. And with that, I leave you with a giant of a man, an example of Black history, but more importantly, human history, Reverend Lemuel Haynes. Thanks, Jen.